Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden of Witts University in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, for the whole time that you and I have been covering the China-Africa story for almost 10 years now, it's been a story of growth of surging trade numbers, surging investment. It's been a story of fear as well that China is taking over Africa. You know, those narratives that we see so much in the international press, uh, fears that uh, among Africans that they're being recolonized again. This idea that the surging Chinese interest knows no bounds whatsoever. There are some indications now, though, that those that trend and those fears may be misplaced, in part because we've seen a dramatic fall in trade between China and Africa, and a general sense maybe that China might be losing interest in Africa as other parts of the world draw China's attention, particularly around one belt, one road, which is the Chinese global trading strategy. And so, Kobus, this idea that China's losing interest in Africa is one that really isn't widely discussed uh, anywhere that I've seen in the African press and among African thinkers. And it really could pose a dramatic problem because China today remains the largest source of uh, infrastructure investment and particularly now even in aid. And it, it forces Africa into a completely new narrative where, you know, before they were wringing hands about what Africa wants from them and, you know, kind of like what the impact of, of what China wants from them, I mean, and what the impact of, of Chinese in, um, engagement with Africa will be. Now it opens a different question of what Africa should do to keep the Chinese around rather than just, you know, kind of like what the Chinese are going to do to Africa. Well, this is a great question. And we have the right person on the show today. Kai Xue is a Beijing-based attorney. He's also an advisor to to many Chinese multinational companies who are seeking outbound foreign investment, particularly in places like Africa. If you've been a longtime listener of the show, you, you've been following uh, his work on our podcast, but also we feature him quite a bit in our discussions. Uh, he writes quite a bit for international newspapers and writing columns. He's a little bit of a contrarian right now, and that's why we're so excited to have you back on the line from Beijing. Welcome, Kai Xue. It's great to have you back on the show. Uh, thanks very much, Eric and Kobus. And it, I, it has been refreshing to see a lot of your comments that have come up on our LinkedIn page over the past, I'd say, six months uh, that are decidedly negative uh, towards the Chinese, bearish, in fact, uh, towards the Chinese in Africa. Let me give you an example. I posted a, uh, a, an infographic about a month ago uh, highlighting the total 2016 China-Africa trade that came in at $149.1 billion. And let me quote back to your comment that you wrote, and I'd like you to expand on that. Trade between China and Africa is down, way down. Trade between China and Africa exceeded $220 billion U.S. dollars in two, 2014. And you say you're now sticking with your prediction made long ago that by the end of the decade, the importance of the China-Africa relationship will recede quite a bit. So I guess my question to you is, is China losing interest in Africa? Well, it, that's um, a really complex question because there are so many elements we can unpack. But, um, well, let, let's first go to the, the main headline number, the one that sets the entire framework for the next or for this current uh, three-year period. And that is uh, the announcements that were made bad, back in December 2015 at the FOCAC where the financial commitments for the three-year period, starting from 2016 to 2018, they were made. And, and you know, these are financial commitments, uh, they're, they're not uh, empty promises. These are, 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 are basically quotas that are being set, and they will be satisfied if not exceeded. What was committed was, uh, as I recall, it was $60 billion in total commitments, and that's including all forms. It's investment, it's infrastructure lending, and it's aid. And that is, I would calculate, 50% higher than the last three-year period. So if we were to go by that main headline number setting the entire framework for this current three-year period, that shows there's actually growth. Uh, but I, I believe, though, uh, you know, it, this was occurring in the context of a lot more outbound investment and a lot more um, construction contracts everywhere in the world put by China. And, and also, of course, the economy is still growing in terms of, uh, you know, every six years it's doubling. 
And so there's going to be growth everywhere. So it doesn't necessarily mean that just because there was a 50% in, increase in this period over the last in Africa, that that, that means, uh, you know, growth is still turbocharged. It could be actually modest. And, and also, I believe because this is, you know, clearly a government set agenda and, you know, the government is, of course, slower to react than the marketplace and has other goals that might not be, you know, wholly market driven. There might be some lag time right now that we're seeing. Uh, and then later on, at the end of the decade, I believe, the, you know, the government, the policymakers will catch up to the marketplace and uh Oh, you know, and and that's why I'm bearish. You know, I, so I I just want to make the point that I I I'm sticking by my prediction, but it's not necessarily born at least by this main framework number, the the full cap commitment. So, do you see that movement happening in the marketplace, though? The, you know, in terms of the, is there um a, a a distinct feeling that that Chinese non-government owned companies are starting to kind of edge away from Africa in, in some kind of way? Perhaps one indication of this is if you were to look at the, the population number of Chinese people in Africa, because, uh, you know, it, it's, it's mostly made up of um, small time entrepreneurs and construction contractors, their employees. So if we we're seeing large changes in those numbers, that, that would be one indication that the private marketplace, at least, uh, doesn't seem to see the same opportunities. And actually, I, I believe something significant has happened in the last three years to this number. Uh, if we were to look at the post, you know, oil, oil price crash from 2014, before then and now, I, I think... I, I, well, I mean, I, I don't have exact numbers, so this is just my educated guess, but I believe the number of Chinese people in Africa has fallen below 1 million. And, and that's, that's a very significant threshold because it's so, you know, you know for, for much of the past 15 years, uh, so, you know, this is one of the big elements that there's over a million people in Africa. Uh, but, but now I believe, especially because of what's happened in Angola, where Seems like all construction activity has stopped. There, the, the economy is a mess, and you know, 80% of people have left. And also in other markets, like in in South Africa and probably other oil-driven markets, there's also been a lot of departures. You know, this number has probably fallen below one million now. How would you know that? Where are you getting your data from to to come up with those estimates? You know, before the oil crash, it was widely discussed that there would be at least one million population. And I, I believe that it was concentrated mostly in, say, 10 different countries. And in those 10 different countries, you would have various, uh, you know, streams of data. You, you, you might have the, and some embassy official make a comment, you know, release a statement. You might have business associations that would have their own estimates. You might have the host government. Uh, they, they would be keeping track. And, and again, because it's so concentrated in a certain few countries, like Angola and South Africa may well be half that number. So to now get a news report from Angola that it's down 80% the population. And, you know, in South Africa, it looks like, you know, the decline has been underway and that I don't know how substantial it is, but, but you know, uh, using those data points, I, I you know, I, I believe I can make an educated guess that it's under a million now. From reading, I've, um, I've you know, g- gathered a, a, a few possible f- factors or reasons for this. I mean, including, you know, a falling commodity prices, um, changes in the Chinese economy with a, a less, less need for raw materials. Um, to which extent... Uh, are the, is this caused by external factors, and to which extent is it caused by African economies just simply playing the game in a bad way, or like you know, kind of like African dysfunction, or what you know, for for any any whatever kind of way of putting it, you know, to, to which extent is it kind of at Africa's door, and to which extent is it simply because of ch- changes in China and the rest of the world? Well, I, I guess there, the you know, there were several factors there, and so if we were to uh, go go through them one by one. There's there's definitely the factor of falling commodity prices. Uh, so you know just to review, let's look at the you know the three big commodities. 
in, in terms of industrialization, oil, iron, copper, uh, you know, oil prices have obviously been down for a few years. Um, uh, iron and copper since 2012 have been down, but, but something interesting happened at the end of last year, which is iron and copper, you know, especially iron recovered quite a bit and it's been holding up that recovery uh, even now. So, you know, if, if this is some kind of long-term trend, then, you know, maybe I, I would have to revise my bearishness to some extent. Even. Uh, but, but, but if we were to assume that this is just a blimp, and let's say now that the, the commodity prices for all these big, you know, minerals and oil, they're, they're, they're permanent. It's a long-term trend. Uh, then, yes, that, that would, uh, you know, dampen the need to, to build relationships in Africa. Uh, because um, that that would mean there would be much less interest across the world in investing in these commodities. And uh, when you have less interest in other places, that means that the state-owned enterprises, if they're interested in investing somewhere, then, you know, they're not going to have competitors and they can just, uh, uh, you know, they, they can buy the license or they can buy the mine and develop it further. So so what, what I mean by this is let, let's, let's think in terms of copper. You know, at the beginning of the century, uh, as we know, the sickle mine deal in Congo, uh, that was a big copper mine deal by state, several state-owned enterprises in, in Congo to, um, to develop a, a larger copper mine. And, and the reason for this was because, you know, back, back in that last decade, there was just a lot of investment in copper. And it was exceedingly difficult to find any worthwhile asset anywhere in the world to, to develop if you're a state-owned enterprise. Because all the multinationals with so much international experience, you know, they, they, they had took all the good stuff. And so they were left with just Congo. And, you know, that, that, that looked like this, you know, outlook for them uh, back in the last decade, which was, um, you know, if there's nowhere else to invest, there's nowhere else to, you know, be the actual owner of these assets and have the security in knowing that, you know, a state-owned enterprise owns these assets. So therefore, let's say, you know, if there were any Western sanctions against China that prohibited uh, these minerals from being exported, uh, you know, there, there was some level of protection in at least owning these assets. So there was some control in the supply system. So, so, so I mean, that, that sets the background for a lot of the reasons of why there needed to you know, be this cultivation of a relationship with Africa back in the last decade. Uh, but, but now, you know, let, let's take the assumption that, you know, these, these minerals are, are prices are, are long-term. They're, they're, they're going to be very soft. And, and that means it just opens up so many opportunities to invest anywhere else in the world. And, and also places that have more reliable, you know, more reliable host countries. And, and one really prime example is uh, what's been happening in the last several years in Peru with outbound investment there. And so in Peru, I would estimate, well, it's not my estimate, but it, it's something in the tens of billions of dollars now of investment just in copper and iron in Peru in the last several years. And that was certainly not available over a decade ago during the, you know, the, the commodity mania. Uh, so, so if we were to think in terms of commodity prices, yes, that would dampen the, you know, the interest if it's low in Africa. But that one of the primary reasons to think about it is just because of how much more investment opportunities there will be across the world. And, and, and then you, you also uh, pointed out to another factor, and this is related, which is, um, uh, well, does it have anything to do with the reliability of the host governments in Africa that turn away investment. And uh, that, I, that, that definitely has something to do with it because, uh, you know, uh, if, if you were to look at all of the oil investments that were made uh, early on in the China-Africa relationship, uh, they're, I, I think maybe with one small exception, they're all in awful shape, you know, like, like whether it's Chad and Jir or especially South Sudan, where that civil war just can't end and it's endangering, you know, you know, puts in danger that entire $20 billion investment. 
And and so, uh, you know, that there there's also that factor where familiarity with these host governments has led to just a lack of confidence in doing anything further. I'm sorry, that's just, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's just something that we've seen over the past four or five years, that the, the Chinese appetite for risk in Africa, uh, and, and not in just in Africa, but in other parts of the world as well, is changing. I, I think Venezuela has been a very instructive story for the Chinese who lent uh, significant amounts of money. I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but it was a significant amount of money to the Venezuelan government. Uh, that money's gone. Uh, the Chinese economy is not growing anywhere near as fast as it was 10, 15 years ago. So the idea of easy access to capital uh, may be changing. So the combination of not wanting to expose yourself to too much volatility and risk and the same time under more domestic political pressure to monitor the, the outbound investment money uh, seems like it's coming together in, in, you know, in timing that doesn't necessarily bode well for Africa. Yes, if you also cite, well, yeah, that's getting to the last factor, which is, um, well, what about China that would perhaps, factors internal that would cause any, um, uh, you know, any any decrease in interest in Africa? And and you cite two things, a slower growth of the economy, uh, but you know what, it, it's still growing at 7%. That's very fast. And uh, com- combined with other factors like, I, I predict currency appreciation and and also, you know, inflation, it's going to double in a very short time still at this pace. And outbound investment is only growing. I mean, even though, as you pointed out, there were capital controls implemented at the end of last year, they're, they're still largely in place. And, and that's meant a lot less investments uh, so far this year. Uh, but, uh, it, it, you know, those capital controls are targeted at that particularly real, you know, like trophy real estate, hotels in first world countries, entertainment, tourism, and, and those investments that would have strategic goals like um, natural resources, you know, would not be as scrutinized. So I, I, that last factor that you cited, uh, in, internal disturbances within China, I, I do not believe have a strong effect on what, we, what I'm predicting or what we're seeing now with the relationship to, with Africa. Um, one of the issues that you raised um, in one of your LinkedIn posts, um, you made the, the comparison between China and Taiwan, um, and you you argued that when Taiwan, um, you know, kind of moved over from becoming a, from being a middle income country to to moving towards being a high income country, a lot of expatriate not a interest, country by the um, way, uh, Kobus just uh, Taiwan's still not a country yet. So I want to put that course, out there. Course, I think a sorry, lot of our mainland country, followers would not be very happy with that. Go ahead. Sorry. Of course, sorry. You you know you know what I mean. I'm I'm sorry about that. Like you know, a, a country like entity nation, um, nation. Yes, um, you know, or, or maybe just simply as an economy. You know, kind of like when 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 Taiwan as a as a separate kind of economy in the world, kind of transitioned from one from middle income level to a higher income level. Um, a lot of the expatriate Taiwanese moved back, um, and you you saying that you're seeing the same kind of trend in China at the moment. It's only natural to, 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 to see this because, uh, well, why did they move in the first place? It's, it's because they believed that they could make, you know, the, the, let, let's take, for instance, the, the example of shopkeepers who would move all the way to Africa to establish a shop. And uh, well, the motivation to do this was because of their belief that they could make at least two times as much in Africa. Because at that time that they set up shop, there was not as much competition. You know, if incomes and, and you know, just to cite some real data, over the last 10 years, you know, blue, blue collar wages have increased by three times here. And, and that means, of course, wages for everything else. And also, you know, have earnings for shopkeepers have also increased. And so it becomes much harder uh, you know, to to earn that that you know two times more in Africa, and so that that would prompt people to leave, either come back or to go to other first world countries. Kobus, you know, let's just kind of step back and look at this because I, I you know I haven't heard a lot about 
the, the great points that Kaishu is making from, you know, domestic income data that would affect immigration to the risk profile that Chinese companies are looking at and also to OBOR, One Belt, One Road, the Chinese global trading strategy. And it feels like to me that the Chinese are expected to spend somewhere around $500 billion on OBOR uh, in countries throughout Central Asia, the Middle East, parts of Africa. So there's going to be a lot more competition for Chinese investment and Chinese money. And I just wonder if African countries have become a little bit lazy over the past 10 or 15 years, that there's this expectation that every five years, China's going to come to Africa for a FOCAC, that's the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Summit, with an even bigger check. And there's this habit that's now being formed that, you know, line up behind Xi Jinping, get your money, and everything's going to be fine. And then, you know, along with that, there's the requisite complaining about you know, all of the the labor issues, the environmental issues, legitimate as they may be, but there's this habit that's been formed. Now, all of a sudden, what we're hearing from Kaishue is that there's a potential shock to the system coming in the next three to five years that I'm not sure African policymakers and African publics are ready for. It's sad to say, but in a lot of ways, Africa's relationship with China is starting to mirror Africa's relationship with the West in the sense that it is this weird mix of Dependency, um, you know, and and sometimes even like charity, um, combined with a lot of resentment and complaining. Um, so, you know, kind of if 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 the Chinese power withdraws in Africa or dim- diminishes in Africa, I think it raises two questions. In the first place, to which extent, you know, is are we going to see the rise of other external actors in Africa? You know, um, the rise of India, the, you know, the incre- you know um, the role of Brazil, the role of the United Arab Emirates. So that's one question. But the second, I think, more important question is to which extent will Africa have managed to use some of these Chinese systems to kickstart intra-African trade? Um, and to which extent, you know, is, is it possible, you know, for, for Africa to finally get to that holy grail of selling African things to other African countries, which has always it has always been stymied among other reasons because of the the of colonial infrastructure and the way that you, all of the gaps in different kind of different colonial infrastructure systems. So I mean it's an open question. We're gonna we're gonna have to see how they respond and, and, and what form the shock takes. And Ko uh, Kaishia, let's look out three to five years now. You have said openly that you are bearish, that you think that the relationship is going to recede quite a bit. Uh, what does that look like in three to five years? Well, uh, you know, that there will still be this central planning and this framework every three years. And so most obviously, I, I think, uh, you know, the comp- all these components of the framework, which is uh, starts off, number one, most importantly, with infrastructure lending, uh, followed closely now by investment, which has risen in profile. And, and and then aid, which is, I, I believe, still half the aid which goes to Africa. And so I see all three of these components being, um, you know, being diminished, de- de- decreasing. And, and also, and it's not just going to be the numbers. It's also just going to be a sense, I think, on the ground and in the public discourse that, uh, you know, this, this wave is, is not that tremendous feeling anymore. And um, and then and then you know then there is something else that I predict might happen, which is that um, for a lot of countries that have you know taken loans and they're still going to be outstanding, and if their, their economies don't improve, then uh, and, and then you know the entire macroeconomic picture of the country starts uh, deteriorating. Uh, and, and this is happening for a lot of African countries that also have outstanding loans. And then I believe that, you know, these uh, these forums, they're not just simply going to be about, uh, you know, new loans being advanced and investments being made, but they, they might become acrimonious in that there's going to be talk about how uh, existing obligations need to be canceled. And uh, perhaps some, one of the reasoning that might be pulled out is that, uh, you know, there are, these loans are odious or oppressive, even though you know they build good infrastructure. But but just because of uh, the desperation of the macroeconomic situation, a lot of you know countries are going to band together and say, you know, mean things. Interesting. It looks like we are 
Potentially on the precipice of entering a new phase of the China-Africa relationship, Kai Xue is a Beijing-based attorney who follows this quite a bit and quite closely, as you can see, and does a lot of really creative, innovative thinking on the subject. He also does uh, advising services as, for as part of his work with uh, Chinese multinationals uh, looking around the world for outbound investment. So I think it's very uh, interesting to follow what he has to say. Kai Xue, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us and also for participating in all of our various conversations on LinkedIn. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's always a pleasure to speak with you guys. Thank you so much. And Kobus and I will be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. For Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show or follow China Africa News that's updated every four hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Kobus at Stadenesk or Eric at E. Olander. That's E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R. Subscribe to the China Africa podcast on iTunes or download the mobile apps for iOS, Android, or Windows Phone. Just head over to your favorite store and search for China Africa.